welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 35,688 people from 160 countries and is supported by 505 organisations. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 53 country contacts, engaged in defending women's rights and do join us as a volunteer. This week, I'm really pleased to say that we have Yao Bano from Afghanistan. She's going to give us an update about the women women's situation in uh, Afghanistan under Taliban control. Then we have Tanya Carter from Safe Schools Alliance from the UK, whose talk is child safeguarding. It's not a political football. Then we're going to hear from Bev Jackson from the LGB Alliance and an uh, update on the activities and ideas and campaigns, etc. Then we're going to hear from Dorothy Appleyard, who is in the German WDI group, and she's going to give us an update on the situation in Germany. Our first uh, speaker is Yao Bano from Afghanistan, and Yao Bano is a woman activist. She works in hiding with her pen and ink to raise her voice for Afghan women and girls. And we're going to see a video. This is Yael from Afghanistan. Thank you, WDI, for inviting me to have an update report about women's situation under the Taliban control. Today, I am talking from a country where it's a crime to be a woman. And it is hardly a day goes by without more bad news and restriction on women. The suffering that Afghan women have suffered women have not suffered in any other land in story. Today, I am presenting the report from a country which women don't have access to their essential right of education, work, or free movement. But if a woman asks about their own right, the answer will be beating, arresting, or killing. I am raising my voice for Afghan women and girls from a country which the Minister of Higher Education said those who write or talk or resist against Taliban deserve to be murdered. This includes both online and offline criticisms of the regime. So, they actively search for every single home and even searching the laptop, phone and all private things to see and find who is working against them. If yes, then they will arrest, beat or kill them. But no one have the right to complain. But Taliban don't know that today's women are not like women during 1996-2001. Today's women strongly believe to an educated mother built a strong nation. And they are stronger than their restriction. Women don't get fear. Afghan women get stronger day by day against them. And Afghan women raise their voices to want their own essential right of education, work, and free movement. Today, I am here to tell you there is no human right, there is no woman right in Afghanistan under the Taliban control. From inside Afghanistan, I plead you, don't forget us. My story is the story of thousands of other women who live under the Taliban control. Afghan women are heroes. We are dying every day, but we are never given up. Since the Taliban regime overtook the country in mid-August 2021, Afghanistan's record on women's rights has been manifestly one of, if not the worst, worldwide. Despite promises to uphold women's rights in line with Sharia law, from the every first week of its rule, the Taliban started suppressing the rights of their citizens with women the main target of restriction, as well as prohibiting women and girls from traveling without the male relative. The Taliban have also denied them primary education, banned them from numerous public places, and restricted their employment to healthcare and primary education. 
In December 2022, women were also banned from working for non-governmental organization in most sectors. Then, in early April 2023, the Taliban extended the ban to include Afghan women working for the United Nations mission in the country. This crackdown on women's rights has attracted considerable international condemnation, including from Muslim state. In response to the regressive policies, many international donors have reduced or treated the whole tier humanitarian assistance, upon which the country is strongly reliant. It is feared that women could unintentionally be the most impacted by this reduction or suspension of humanitarian aid. Afghanistan is not the only country where women rights are being ruled back. But what is happening in Afghanistan is an alarm bell for all of us. It shows how decades of progress on gender equality and women rights can be literally wiped out in a month. As you read or watch the news about women rights in Afghanistan, unfortunately, the all is correct news. Today, Afghanistan is at a critical juncture. It is the only country in the world where women don't have access to their basic rights. There are countless unsolved problems facing Afghan women, but because of distraction, women can share their stories with each other. And on other side, there is no ear, no organization, and no group to hear the problem of Afghan women. Afghan women are entirely isolated. To make sense of this moment, it helped to discuss the Taliban story. I'll start with the year I was born. I was newborn baby during the Taliban first time of power in Afghanistan, and I wasn't aware of how women were treated then. But last year, my grandma, my mother, and my sister helped to reopen a old box of burqa, which they picked away 20 years ago. They told me unbelievable stories about the horrible ways where women were treated. My grandma shared how Taliban entered to Afghanistan for the first time. They entered to Afghanistan, which at that time, a full men and women were educated. The Taliban used from name of Islam and the conditions of traditional society to manipulate educated people. They were particularly cruel to women. People can just forget or forgive all the killing. My grandma said almost every family in Afghanistan now knows of somebody or has a family member who was killed by the Taliban. The Golden Years 2001 up to 2021 Despite my country's money issues, 2001 up to 2021 was a golden time for Afghan women. The Taliban was ousted and women started to learn about their rights and gained autonomy in their life. I was one of those girls whose life was changed for the better. Despite the relatives' objections, my parents enrolled me in school and I was the first girl in our extended family to attend. Our relatives said that I shouldn't go to school past at the age of 12, but my parents said we had hard time, but we don't want hard time for our children, especially for our daughters. Then I continued to school, then university, then I had job for four years. This is not to say women life were easy in Afghanistan. Traditional society, war, and Taliban law continued in some regions, and many girls were shut out of education. Still, life was better than it is now. Return of Taliban 2021 till today. When the Taliban returned to power on August 50, 2021, I was a 22 years old. Every day since then, I have woken up with a heavy chest. I see the four wall around me and nothing more. Day by day, the Taliban has announced 
new restrictions on women. Before the Taliban came to power in Afghanistan, I was a social worker in a private office. But after the arrival of the Islamic government, everything fell apart. The office I had worked closed in four days after the Taliban took over. Thirteen co-workers of me were arrested by Taliban and we received messages that they were searching for all other members of this office. So we immediately break our scene and board our documents to hide our identity. Right now today, I can see the city, the bazaar from the window, but nothing is same as before. No women are mailing about and the city is very silent. The city is covered in black. If women wear colored clothes, the Islamic government will beat them. I saw with my own eyes the Taliban member beat a girl with a gun because her body was not covered from head to toes. I hope to have a promising future, but it now feels dark. I want to go back to the past and breathe easy. I cannot wear the clothes I want. I cannot fairly go where I want. This is life for Afghan girls. This life for Afghan girls is one of the prisoners who do not know when they will be released. Today, Afghan women are not like women of 1996 and 2001. Today's women know about their right and right of their life and have the power of education to raise their voices worldwide to take action. Today's women want to be heard. They want you to know that under the Taliban control, women don't have freedom of movement. Women cannot participate in public and politics. Women are not able to be active in civil society. Women are totally removed from the society. We used to have access to national wide network of shelter and services for those facing gender-based violence, including legal representation, medical care, and psychological support. And it served thousands of women and girls each year. As the Taliban took control of Afghanistan, the system collapsed. I heard the situation is more horrible in some areas and provinces of Afghanistan, where women don't have access to internet, mobile, or they don't have education. There are reports the Taliban has taken cruel actions such as kidnapping, target killing, killing by stone and forced marriages in small areas. Still, we are fighting for our rights. I have heard horrible stories from other women activists who have been arrested by the Taliban. For example, one of them said, Taliban badly beat them and their male relatives. One of them said, we were like fish out of water for several days. Another woman said, the only food they received was old bread. I gave it to my kids to keep them alive. My kids were thirsty. There was no water. There was a bin where the women of the Taliban washed their dishes. I used this water for my kids to drink. They were crying because it was dirty. The Taliban searched our Facebook, search our call, laptop, and all documents, and they played our messages and asked about them. Where are your other friends? They said, you must help us to find them. We were released by making a promise. After this day, we won't do anything against the Taliban. I am one of the women activists living in Afghanistan under the direct threat of Taliban. The Taliban actively search for all who work or talk against them. I am in danger, but I can't stop. The Taliban are lying. They are just want to fight for power. I am in hiding, fighting for my right and right of other women. I know that the Taliban searching for me and it is easy for the Taliban to kill to the group 
which work or talk against him because of me my siblings and parents are also under the direct threat we are not safe i work in hard to hide my identity and identity of my parents currently i am hiding from the taliban but one day they will kill me or my family members Afghan women urgently need to health services, humanitarian assistance, and justice now. I'll continue this struggle with my pen and inks, raising my voice for Afghan women and girls. It is about 598 days since the Taliban banned teenage girls from school. Afghanistan remains the only country in the world where women and girls are denied their basic right. Brave Afghan women are still protesting in Afghanistan despite of thousand restrictions and they ask about their right and right of their life. Banning women and girls from education by the Taliban is a crime against humanity. As women and girls in Afghanistan, I can't go outside home lonely without male relative. I can't go to school over the age 12. I can't go to university or gym or park. I can't be engineer or pilot or singer in future. I can't go work except as a doctor or nurse to work in some hospital. I can't go to male doctor for treatment. I can't deal with male shopkeeper. I should wear a long workout which cover from my head to toes. Wiping of women in public for having non covered ankles. Public stoning of women accused of having sex outside marriage. A number of lovers are stoned to death under these rules. I can talk or shake hands with non mahram males. I can laugh loudly. No stranger should hear a woman voice. I can't riding in a taxi without a madam. I can't present in a radio, television, or public gathering. If yes, I should cover my faces during TV program or others. I can't play sports or entering a sports center or club. I can ride bicycle or motorcycle even with my madam. I can't wear bright color clothes. I can't listen to music, not only for women, but men as well. I cannot go on female public paths. Woman pictures cannot be printed in newspaper or book or hang on walls or houses or shops. Women must not use perfume in public. Based on the above restriction, Taliban want from women to be all the time home and women don't have permission to breathe without their rules. I didn't give up like thousand others to work and raise my voice for Afghan women even in a very horrible situation. I'll continue this struggle with my pen and ink. In such a hopeless situation which is school or closed for family students we still continue to our work since August 2021 as a volunteer group of young and educated members of our society under the name of Yalbonus Group to help female students from inside our home from 7 up to 12th grade of school via online training programs and we teach them different subjects as secret online schooling. Until today, 500 students are learning and graduated from our online program. And also, as women can go work outside home, it have a very bad impact on family economy situation. We still try to help and provide food and urgent need for those families which live in a very hard economic situation. And still, we have thousand families in our record which urgently need food and humanitarian assistance. What we do for girls and women, it all are just friendly and humanitarian works. We don't want to become famous. We don't want to get profit. We just want to help each other and together make a change.
Our work is totally private, hidden and friendly inside our homes. And we all are connecting via internet. So it is very safe way for all of us to continue our work. At the end, as we all know the Afghan woman problems very well. So there's no need for more explanation of the problem. There's exactly need for actions. From inside Afghanistan, I plead you, don't forget us. Please stand with Afghan woman. Please let Afghan woman learn. Please help us in such a horrible situation. Please help Afghan families with food and humanitarian assistance. With your help and support, you will save a family from hunger. You will save a daughter from child forced marriages. You will save a father to not sell their body sport to provide food for their families. Thank you for your attention. From uh, Safe Schools Alliance, Tanya Carter, over to you. For those who don't know Safe Schools Alliance and what we do, um, we are a grassroots UK group that concentrates on upholding existing safeguarding frameworks in schools and we concentrate on ensuring that schools are working with the correct interpretation of the Equality Act. We are mainly working with English legislation. When we're asked about the situation in Wales, we generally direct people to Met Cymru and I really hope that I've said that correctly and that no one Welsh is dying quietly in the audience. For Scotland, we direct women to SOX Scotland, which is a fairly new group that have just been set up to um, defend safeguarding in Scottish schools. And there's also Four Women Scotland, who are a long-standing group. We also speak to various women in Ireland, in both um, the Republic and the Northern I and Northern Ireland. We speak to women such as Kerry Black and her wife Lauren and Tracy Dempsey, who I've spotted in the chat here. Our philosophy on global child safeguarding is that we take the view that was expressed by Vashnavi Sunder at Philia. And again, I hope I've said Vashnavi's um, name correctly. And if I haven't, again, apologies. When we heard her speak in 2021, she said that the best thing that we can do in this country to help women in other countries is to hold the line here. She said, you have got to hold the line here on the rights of women and girls, on the rights to single sex spaces, single sex toilets, because we have to remember that they were, that was the first right we won in this country and it helped us get all our other rights. We won the right to single sex toilets and that enabled us to participate in public life and move forward. So we must hold the line here so that women in other countries have a system that they can point to and they can aspire to. We believe that it is absolutely essential that we all hold the line globally that under 18s are children. They're not young adults, they're not young people, under 18s are children because this is what gives them rights to protection in international law. Children's rights globally to be protected by adults, they are enshrined in the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is the most rapidly and widely ratified international human rights treaty in history. The convention changed the way that children are viewed and treated. That is, we now treat them as human beings with a distinct set of rights instead of as passive objects of care and charity. We believe that the age of consent for marriage and sexual intercourse for both heterosexuals and homosexuals should be 18 globally. We must be absolutely clear that nobody should be having sex with children and that under 18s should all be entitled to free education provided by the state, regardless of their sex. We are absolutely clear that children who are themselves already parents must never be shamed or stigmatised. They must be supported by society in their role as parents so that they may safeguard their own children as others fulfil their their responsibility to safeguard them. 
we are absolutely clear at Safe Schools Alliance when we talk about children's rights, that we are talking about their rights to be protected, about their right to a childhood free from harm, their right to live with and be protected by their own parents, especially their mother, unless it is proven detrimental to their health or welfare, at which point the state has a duty to intervene. The United Nations um, Charter on the Rights of the Child is absolutely clear that children should not be separated from their parents unless one or both parents are abusive or neglectful or their home environment is unsafe. Excuse me. We are extremely concerned when groups and individuals talk about children's rights in the context of bodily autonomy or giving consent. Whether this is deliberate or inadvertent, it undermines child safeguarding. And from the point of view of protecting children, it really doesn't matter whether people are intending to harm children or not. Any loopholes in safeguarding must be identified and closed. Those who do not understand that cannot be involved in any way in writing legislation that affects children. We need to be absolutely clear that children are not adults. It is recognised in keeping children safe in education. And that is one of our main safeguarding documents in this country. And in that document, it recognises that adults who do not understand that children are different to adults pose a potential risk to children. This is an important part of safer recruitment. The safer recruitment and DBS checks were introduced in this country and added to our existing safeguarding legislation following the Bishard inquiry. The Bishard inquiry was an inquiry into the deaths of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman at the hands of Ian Huntley. Huntley was a school caretaker at a school and it was a feature of his employment as a caretaker that pertinent information had been discarded under the guise of protecting his rights under data protection. So this is a very important point that if safeguarding had been prioritised rather than anyone saying, oh yes, but what about Ian Huntley's rights? Ian Huntley's rights under the Data Protection Act and not passing on concerns which um, were unproven. If safeguarding had been prioritised, Ian Huntley would never have been working as a caretaker in a school. The other, the other report that fed into safer recruitment was the Warner report. And that was a report into abuse in children's care homes like in Islington. And Julie Bindle recently wrote about some of the background to this for the Cricket, for the Critic magazine. And in that she says, in 1980s London, one council decided that as gay men are oppressed, they must all be good. And the results of this were catastrophic. And what she means by that is that children were harmed and abused because people either felt too scared to raise concerns or they raised concerns and they were dismissed as homophobic. So that was one of the catastrophic harms that children were abused. The other catastrophic harm, of course, is the detrimental effect that had on the gay community themselves and how it contributed to them all being smeared as child abusers in an already homophobic environment that was panicking over AIDS. And again, all the stuff that Julie Bindle wrote about in this article, this is all talked about on safer recruitment training. And anybody who didn't already know what Julie has just written about and understand the implications of it, and able to take the learning from those previous failings and apply them to what's going on today, anyone who doesn't have that depth of understanding, they have absolutely no business whatsoever being involved in making decisions about the safety, welfare, 
and education of children. It is essential that those charged with the protection of children don't just chant the mantras that we're all taught on child protection training, such as think the unthinkable, and you never know anyone well enough to say they couldn't, wouldn't, or didn't. You actually need to understand them. You actually need to apply them. You need to apply them to your own lives. You really need to understand that those mantras apply to your friends, your families, your colleagues. They even apply to your intimate partners. And you must understand that other people have to apply that to you too. And it's not personal. That's what safeguarding is. And people really need to understand that it does happen. And every successful predator has friends and family who would swear in a court of law that he wouldn't do that no matter how much evidence is provided. Upholding important laws around safeguarding demands constant vigilance. Child safeguarding is the responsibility of every single adult on this planet. And though, while it is the responsibility of every single adult, the primary sources of safeguarding in a child's life are that child's parents. All mothers, have parental responsibility from the moment of a child's birth. Fathers who are married to the mother or named on the birth certificate also have parental responsibility. Parental responsibility in this country can only be revoked by a court. Parental responsibility in the UK means that your most important roles are to provide a home for your child and to protect and maintain your child. You are also responsible for disciplining the child. And of course, this doesn't mean um, corporal punishment. This means things like um, ensuring the child gets up in the morning, goes to school, or if you're home educating, completes their education at home, does their homework, goes to bed at night, leaves a healthy lifestyle. You're responsible for choosing and providing the child's education. You're responsible for agreeing for the child's medical treatment. You're responsible for naming the child and agreeing to any change of name. And these responsibilities are very important when we're looking at some of what's going on in schools in the UK at the moment. You are responsible for looking after your child's property. So we say that when school staff encourage and include with, include with children in keeping secrets from their parents. This not only undermines parental responsibility, but it is a separation of the child from their family, which is not in the spirit of the UN Convention. Safe Schools Alliance has always adhered strictly to both the spirit and the letter of the law with regards to safeguarding. Nothing trumps safeguarding. We will always uphold safeguarding children's rights when interpre interpreted correctly and parental responsibility above all else. We adhere to safer recruitment standards when deciding who to work with and which campaigns to support. Our values, our strategy and our reputation at Safe Schools Alliance is all underpinned by child safeguarding. This means that we tend to work alone so that we can remain absolutely focused on child safeguarding. We have occasionally worked on joint campaigns or signed joint letters, but generally we work alone so that we can remain absolutely focused on child safeguarding and that goal cannot be undermined. This does then leave us with largely just me delivering the message publicly, and it does mean I am somewhat overworked. However, there are lots of absolutely amazing women working quietly in the background at Safe Schools and Lions, and we should never, ever forget them or what they have contributed to protecting children in this country, because they've all done an absolutely amazing job. And without all of them behind me, I would never be, I would never be here speaking to you. I would never have been in front of the Women's Inequality um, Committee speaking up on behalf of all of us. 
Um, of course, this does also mean that we differ from some other groups in some detail, but we never air these differences either in the media or online. Because we adhere to child safeguarding principles above all else, that is the principle we apply to who we will work with. So we do speak to those such as Victor at the UN recently, who we disagree with. We do not screen groups or individuals on the basis of their religion, their politics, or whether they do or don't claim to be feminist. Indeed, we believe doing so would be a breach of the Equality Act. We merely screen on whether we think they or their attitudes pose any potential risk to children. We always prioritise children. Nobody has a right to work with children. Because of this, we are sometimes characterised as being right wing or coming from a religious perspective, neither of which is true, but that doesn't stop some of the media stereotyping us. It's lazy journalism and we constantly battle with this. Our media advisor tells TV and radio producers, if you think you're booking Mary Whitehouse, you're not. Because we understand safeguarding, we recognise insults such as prudes, bigots, pearl clutchers, Nazis and fascists for the tired and predictable silencing techniques that they are. And we ignore them. And you should too. We also encounter people who think they have a different view on safeguarding to us and we should agree to disagree. No, that's not going to happen. They simply do not understand safeguarding. Those publicly exposing their insufficient understanding of safeguarding like this are merely advertising both their own and their organization's susceptibility to grooming. We would absolutely beg people to stop saying that child safeguarding is right wing and to stop arguing to undermine it in the name of the left, gay rights or feminism. In England, a proud part, part of what, what is now referred to as Turf Island, we are making some progress with the government, but it is slow going. Um, as Bernadette said when she introduced me, we recently got to talk to Parliament. We, ugh, sorry, I've completely lost where I am now. But as Bernadette said when she introduced me, um, I've recently appeared um, at the Women in Quality Select Committee on the review of RSE materials. And we have finally secured that because of our group and lots of other groups. And we, we are doing quite well here now. Safe Schools frequently speaks to parliamentarians and we frequently get quoted in print media. And also now I'm getting more opportunities on TV and radio. And we hear a lot of common sense talked about safeguarding and a lot of MPs and peers in different political parties do really have a commitment now to upholding child safeguarding. But similarly, as we did see in the Women's and Equalities Select Committee, we are still dealing with far too many who really don't seem to have a grasp on safeguarding or material reality. So while it's good that we have managed to secure this view, and I really would encourage everyone to watch it online if you are able to, it has taken us many years of unpaid work and lobbying by different groups and individuals to get us this far. And like I say, if you watch the video, it is absolutely incredible to see elected representatives several years behind where they should be um, wheeling out tired old tropes about section 28. You can see on Twitter the rage that this has provoked in those who lived through the AIDS crisis and fought hard against section 28. And I just find it, Kate Osborne, she's a lesbian. I'm straight and I find it amazing that it's me there um, trying to explain to her that children who will grow up to be lesbian and gay are not being properly supported in schools these days. Why on earth has she not engaged with 
many of the lesbian and gay groups that are making the exact same point. Beth, who you will hear from next, why is Kate Osborne not met with LGB Alliance? Why is she not met with le lesbian labour? They're women in her own party. Why is she not met with the Gay Men's Network? There are loads of people who she could speak to who know so much more about how this all impacts on gay rights than I do. People who were there fighting against Section 28 with her. And as I said in that session, and it has been widely reported in the press, the right wing conservative government in this country has overseen the worst medical child safeguarding and lobbying scandal this country has ever seen. And rather than do their job and hold the government to account, the left wing Labour opposition has instead attacked and defamed whistleblowers and tried to silence them. And they have been aided and abetted in this by the left wing media. The only people who have held this utterly shambolic administration to account have been their own backbenchers. A few brave opposition MPs, the Lords, members of the public, and the few celebrities such as JK Rowling who are prepared to endure the rape and death, death threats and the cancellations. Keir Starmer's Labour has been missing in action, ignoring his own grassroots members. So thanks to those few brave individuals, we are now having a public conversation. We will now be talking about how unfettered access to hardcore porn and being groomed into gender identity ideology online harms children. We will be holding those schools that are not scrutinising materials used in sex education classes to account. We will be insisting that the UN doesn't throw out its responsibility to ensure every child deserves freedom from abuse. Children should be free from harmful work, drugs, sexual abuse, human trafficking, corporal punishment, emotional and psychological abuse, harmful detention, war, and, and any other forms of exploitation. And we are going to insist that the UN upholds this and that they don't just throw it all away for glitter and rainbows and ARCAS funding. We have left our report on the shocking similarities between the ideology expressed by PI, WHO and UNESCO with Victor. And we've also sent it to Reen. And we will be chasing this up because we do want to meet with them and discuss further what is going on with child safeguarding globally. So I'm often asked, what, what can you do? People say, what can we personally do? Well, stand up, be counted, fulfill the responsibility you share with every other adult on this planet to safeguard children. Hold your local school to account. Hold your elected representatives to account. If you live in a democracy, you exercise your rights. You owe it to all those who don't. You owe it to our mothers. You owe it to our grandmothers and our foremothers. If you have any rights at all, you owe it to those who fought for them, who died for them to exercise them. You owe it to your daughters and your granddaughters. You owe it to those girls in Afghanistan denied an education. You owe it to every child on this planet. If you're in the UK, you can check out our website. Go to resources and we have put the Equality Act and the child legislation, child safeguarding legislation into easy to understand fact sheets on our websites. And there's lots of template le letters there. And we've really broken it down so it's very easy for parents and teachers to understand. You do not need to be a lawyer. If you are running a school, you need to understand what your actual legal responsibilities are, not what some lobby group has told you the law is, because if something goes wrong and a child is harmed on your watch, it will be you who is responsible, not the person who gave you the incorrect information, it will be you, the leaders at that school. And school leaders really do need to understand this now and they need to take action now so that in another three years time, 
they are not giving evidence at a public inquiry, making themselves look every bit as ridiculous and out of touch as Kate Osborne just did. If you're not in the UK, look at our website for inspiration. Combine talents with other women in your country and you build a website that works for you and your country. So we're going to go to Bev from LGB Alliance, Bev Jackson, um, also incredibly inspiring and having just sort of got a niche and created an amazing organisation which has inspired people all over the world and made massive significant change in a reasonably short time, just a few years, has changed the face of this this fight. Um, so thank you so much, Bev, for coming along and over to you. Kate Harris and I founded LGB Alliance um, in October 2019 having tried for several years to get Stonewall to listen to the way in which um, their embrace of gender identity was having this very, very harmful effect on um, gay people, bisexual people, and particularly on lesbians. Particularly on lesbians, I want to emphasize that. It's not a, a, a by no means a coincidence that LGB Alliance was founded by two lesbians. Our, our chief executive, Kate Barker, is a lesbian and also the chair of trustees, um, Eileen Gallagher, OBE is also um, a lesbian. And we've always had a, a tremendous emphasis. It's so important to understand that. We do feel that what we did by um, setting up LGB Alliance, we are the only registered charity that um, campaigns exclusively for people who are attracted to others of the same sex. Um, certainly in the UK and possibly in the world, I, I'm not sure about that, but as a registered charity. As you know, uh, our charitable status is being um, has been uh, challenged um, by uh, mermaids um, funded by, by, by a barrister. Um, and that court case, which was heard in court last September, and then with the last two days of closing statements in November last year, we are still waiting for the judgment. So I cannot say anything about it. I know everybody wants to hear, and so do we. And um, I, obviously we're um, still um, very, uh, very much um, hoping that that judgment will come soon, but I cannot say anything about that court case. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to do so. Um, just, uh, uh, and it has meant, of course, that because of the court case that has um, slowed down our activities somewhat, we, we cannot, um, for instance, apply for funding for the helpline that this is our, our major project, one of our major projects, which is uh, to have a helpline for young um, LGB people. Um, at the moment, um, gender identity has subsumed everything, everything, every child who has some problem that they say is related to gender, it's assumed to be a gender identity thing. And that means that a lot of um, young teenagers are um, who may be struggling with their sexual orientation are led to believe through all sorts of, 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 of sources online and at school peers and so on to think that they've got a gender identity issue and to go down the gender um transition route. So we, we very much uh, um, are looking forward to setting up um, our, our helpline, which will be for, um, which will be manned or womaned <laughs> exclusively by um, LGB people. And once the, um, you know, we, we hope uh, soon that our charitable status will be will be confirmed and we can go ahead with that. We have other other plans. Of course, we, we are building up um, an LGB history archive um, and uh, um, a student network. We, we have uh, many other, other, and we have a, a, a major conference every year uh, at the QE2 Centre in October. The um, the webinars from, from that, or the, uh, sorry, I should say, the panel discussions from that are online and you can see them on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, I'd like to start actually by talking about um, Victor Magical Borlos. Um, I think everybody knows that Victor Magical Borlos is the so-called independent, so-called expert, it's a bit rude, but I do think that's rather appropriate, um, for um, sexual orientation and gender identity. As you know, um, he's been um, in office at the United Nations since 2017, um, and um, it's become more and more clear that he is only interested in gender identity and not only ignores the sexual orientation part, of his task, but actually active, uh, actively works against it 
because um, and I had an article in the critic about this yesterday, and um, I, I would invite you to read also what happened when we met, we met him. So Victor recently came to the UK, um, and he's nearing the end of his term. Um, he came to the UK on an official visit, and he met um, mainly with other gender identity enthusiasts. As, as Tish, you know, the, the doubtable researcher has discovered, he is funded by the Arcus Foundation, and that means um, that he is, he, he, uh, is I, I, I have called him a, a paid mouthpiece for gender identity. I don't think that's unfair um, because he doesn't seem to grasp the different, um, the different predicament of, of people who are attracted to the same sex and how they are disadvantaged by this emphasis on gender identity and particular self-ID. And Victor goes around the world saying that self-ID is, um, is required by international law. That's absolute nonsense. He also um, keeps saying that uh, we're all in all the countries that have self-ID, there's never been any problems. I mean, that is so completely absurd. We, we have sent him so many examples um, of abuses in, in prisons and uh, um, of course, in, in refuges and uh, in, in sports, uh, 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 and in particular, lesbian spaces and young lesbians, as I've just said, um, being impacted particularly by this huge surge in, in teenage girls seeking to, um, to go on testosterone, have their breasts removed and so on, which in the United States, where it's very heavily commercial thing, um, happens at a very young age. Anyway, so we we wanted to bring these things to his attention, and he eventually did agree to meet with us, including he originally planned to meet right at the end of his uh, uh, of his visit with all the women's groups that, that had asked to meet with him and um, the three um, lesbian and gay groups, which were LGB Alliance and the Gay Men's Network and Lesbian Labour. And we made a case for having a separate meeting for those three groups, and we eventually had that. It was quite a hostile meeting. Because, um, especially with Kate Harris um, for LGB Alliance, we have reason to, to, to believe that Victor is not particularly interested in our arguments since we've making, been making them politely for years and he simply ignores them or pretends that he doesn't know. It's quite important. Uh, Tanya's referred to the, uh, the rights of the child. Victor seems to be suggesting that it is a right of the child to, as she says, bodily autonomy. Whenever you hear that phrase bodily autonomy, you, you have to realize that this is a direct attack on child safeguarding. Um, and so I totally agree with, with what Tanya says about that. And we must resist that. And uh, also at the UN, CEDAW, which is the only um, convention left which still um, require, re, um, refers to, to sex-based rights, there are people at the United Nations trying to change that to gender. Um, anyway, we have um, tried to um, uh, um, highlight the way in which Victor is working against um, the rights of lesbians, gays, and bisexuals, and only um, trying to push through self-ID with a lot of um, things which are not true. And I would invite everybody else to do so, please, from you within your own country. Apparently, he says he has no example, nobody sends him examples. Well, send him personal examples, please do, of how ways in which um, self ID disadvantages um, women and lesbians in particular. Please send him these examples because. It, it, if it, it, only sending them in terms of general rules apparently doesn't work, I'm not at all sure that sending him personal examples will work anyway, but please do so, so that, that the evidence is there, so that you can show that you have provided this evidence. I would hope that everybody would do that. So that is um, Victor. Um, and um, uh, Victor's due to pr produce another report in June. One thing that's been suggested is that you could beforehand um, look at the, at the terms of that report and suggest the, the, the questions you, you hope it would answer and then grade him on those afterwards. That's also a good idea. Um, so there is, um, it's been a bit of a roller coaster in, um, in the UK. Um, we've had various universities um, try to stop events that they didn't like. We've had, um, and in, uh, in particular, Oxford, Cambridge and Edinburgh, and then Joanna Cherry was uh, was invited to take part um, at an event at the stand in Edinburgh, and then she was uninvited because the staff didn't like her 
presumably didn't, um, gender critical views. And Joanna um, sent them a very, very long legal letter and that made it very clear that she was in the right. They were guilty of direct discrimination and they had to apologize. And now she's been re-invited to take part in that event. Um, and of course, Joanna wasn't doing this for herself. She was doing it on behalf of all those other people who were constantly, other women who were constantly being no platformed. Um, and um, it, so this was a really important and successful um, um, move by her. Um, in Scotland, we're waiting for two different different things. We're waiting for, um, you, you know that the um, Gender Recognition Reform Bill has been um, blocked um, by the by Westminster because it would interfere with, with the Equality Act. And we're waiting for the judicial review on that. And we're also waiting for the challenge um, to L Lady Haldane's ruling, which was that sex is legal sex rather than biological sex. In, in Westminster, we're going to be having uh, um, the, um, your, um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has called for um, the, um, the word sex to be defined clearly in the Equality Act as biological sex. This caused a huge outcry and this has yet to be resolved and we're hoping very much that it will be resolved in that way and that will um, further um, cement the rights of women um, under the Equality Act and also the rights of lesbians because sexual orientation is a sex-based right as well. Um, LGB Alliance has called for a public inquiry um, in fact, Tanya also called for a public inquiry. We really need a public inquiry into how we have reached the state at which the whole discourse on sex and gender has become distorted throughout all institutions in UK society. And I would encourage people in other um, countries too to call for a public inquiry where, where you, how is it possible that um, rights which have um, been built up so carefully over decades are being undermined um, in, in the name of what? It, what, what we do be, believe that um, LGB Alliance has had a very, very particular role, not just in inspiring lots and lots of other LGB groups around the world, but in disrupting the narrative, or we could say tearing up the script. What was the script until LGB Alliance came along? The script was, if you disagreed with gender identity, you were homophobic. Well, the, and then we came along, and I think that is why the, the, there was so much fury directed at us, because we showed, no, sorry, there's plenty of lesbians and gays and bisexuals who do not subscribe to gender identity theory, who do not want self-ID. And so people, there, it, it gave, made it possible for people who disapproved of um, gender identity theory or saw the risks that it posed, they were able to say so. It made it easier for them to say so without being accused of, of homophobia. So we do think that we've played quite a key role and that that is probably why um, all the accusations are constantly leveled at us uh, and we're called all sorts of names. And uh, fortunately, we're used to being called names. And in fact, everybody who um, these days um, promotes sex-based rights is called so many horrible names that um, we almost... Um, think it sort of confirms that our, our, those who oppose us have no arguments. All they can do is call us horrible names. Um, I want to draw attention to the GenSpect conference um, uh, uh, because, um, as you know, um, GenSpect, um, led um, mainly by Stella O'Malley, um, decided to have a conference in Ireland at the same time and in the same town as EPATH, which is the European part of WPATH. And the, um, whereas EPATH is very much pro medicalization of, of kids with gender dysphoria, um, GenSpect is, is highly critical of it and, and, and a very open organization exploring all the various social and psychological aspects around um, this issue and encouraging people to think critically, which is not something that is terribly common in, um, in EPATH or in, in WPATH. Um, I would encourage you very much to look at their um, videos um, also, which are now online. That was just last week, that event. And what they said, um, what Stella said um, at a key moment in that conference was, it's really important to explain to people that, um, that 
being, being gay and being trans are two different things. They've been stuck together in this LGBTQ XYZ uh, um, collection of letters or at the United Nations as SOGI, sexual orientation and gender identity. By, by putting them together, the public has been con completely confused and thinks that this is all the same sort of thing. It's really important to emphasize to everybody you speak to and in the letters that you write. Now I would, yes, encourage everybody to write letters, write to your school, for instance, about the material that, that Tanya has been talking about, write to your member of parliament, especially if you've got um, stories to tell them that, that bring it to life for them. If you start saying sex and gender issues, people's eyes glaze over. But as soon as you say, my sister did this, and then now she's my, my brother, and actually I don't know what's going on and my parents can't cope. And if you give people, um, personal stories that they find easier to relate to, um, this seems to work better than keeping things on the general level. So I would I would very much encourage people to do that. Talk to the people around you and do dare to speak up because every day you hear someone say, oh, I didn't really dare to speak to so and so. And then I did. And they said, oh, I totally agree with you. Just yesterday, or was it today, we saw for the first time um, a, a democratic uh, um, member of Congress speaking up um, in, um, in, in, uh, in favor of raising the age um, of any kind of medicalization to 18. This is very, very brave um, for a Democrat to do because as you know, in the United States, it's incredibly polarized. So encourage, when you see someone like that in a position of leadership, um, speaking out, do encourage them, support them, show that they are not alone because these people are often attacked mercilessly and they really welcome the support they get from others. So everybody can play their own role as, as um, Kate and I said in our, our at the end of our speeches um, at our conference uh, uh, in October, everybody can, can play their own particular role think of your own strengths, think of your positions, how can you move this, the, the, this um, uh, conversation further and break down what's, what's happened, which is a really pernicious attack on the rights of women and LGB people. Join together, if there isn't an LGB group in your country, maybe you, uh, you, you could set one up. Um, you can contact us to see if we know anybody there. And I just wish you all, I'm so happy that this, um, this webinar exists. I think it's a powerful place for, for women and I'm really happy to be here. Now, Dorothy's going to be speaking about the situation in Germany and we'll be able to talk about all the different changes in terms of gender identity, ideology, women's rights. Today, I wanted to talk about the new self-ID law that has been on the cards for a while, you may have heard. Um, mm. The draft proposal of this new self-ID law was published just recently, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, it, according to the German government, is a replacement and improvement to the current legisla legis legislation, which is the Transsexuellen Gazette, the Transsexual Act. Um, so first, I'll just give a few, a, little, a brief summary of the Transsexual Act to see where the starting point is and where Germany is wanting to move to. The Transsexual Act has been around since the early 80s and allows people to be legally recognised as the sex other than that, other than they were born with. It also allows people to change their first name, which is actually a very big thing in Germany. You can't just change your first name because you want to. There's no deed poll here. <laughs> so that um, it also makes it very, well, I say very easy. It also offers an easier option for people to change their first name if they wish to have the first name of the other sex as a first move to living as the other sex. Um, but yes, you can also have your registered sex changed by law, subject to certain conditions at the moment. You have to have lived in the chosen sex for three years at least, and present two expert medical reports confirming that it will be beneficial for you to change your legal sex. Uh, you also have to state that you plan to live as the other sex with high probability, long term, i.e. the rest of your life. Um, one thing that maybe some people don't know is that Germany is also one of the few places in Europe where it is possible to have a third sex entered into your passport ID. Um, you can 
register to become the diverse category where you would, for example, get an X in your passport. So looking at that way, the situation is already relatively flexible in Germany. And the situation for changing your registered sex did used to be a lot stricter <laughs> before the 80s. You could still you could still get, get the entry changed, but you had to have undergone sex reassignment surgery. And interestingly, you had to prove that you were permanently infertile. So <laughs> coming from there, the situation has been made a lot easier in Germany already, but that's not enough for some people. Um, yeah, interestingly, something that we at WDI Germany only became aware of recently is that there is a line in the German constitution, which has been in there since 2011, stating that sex is not just physical and that a sexual identity can also exist. So it's pretty obvious that they've been setting the scene for self-ID law for, for longer than we thought. Yeah, and the, the current German government, which is known here as the, the traffic, traffic Light Coalition, because it's made up of three different parties, the Social Democrats, the, the Liberals and the Greens, want to replace the Transsexual Act with the new Self-Determination Act, as it's uh, literally translated as on Self-ID, um, with the aim of removing financial and bureaucratic hurdles. Um, yeah, <laughs> they state that it serves to only make life easier for trans community and that it does not harm anyone else, something which we all know not to be true. So the new law, what does it involve? The new law would allow anyone, and I really mean anyone above the age of 14, to legally change their name and registered sex simply by submitting a declaration at the local registry office. Um, if that wasn't astonishing enough, something even more astonishing is that the proposed law would allow people to make this change once mm -hmm. a year if they wanted to, which is quite a change from the Transsexual Act, where you have to prove that there's, um, where you have to state that there's a very high probability that you would live in your chosen sex for the rest of your life. Yeah, another significant change is that the need for a um, expert medical opinion um, is completely removed. It's literally just based on, on your own feeling and your declaration that you make. And parents can even request to change the registered sex of their children who are under the age of 14. Yeah, so very, very worrying <laughs> that anyone can change their registered sex simply by making a declaration and paying a very minimal fee. Um, opens up the door to misuse on many levels, as you can imagine. It also lumps all identities together, including intersex people, you know, in the same umbrella as uh, all different genders that are meant to exist. Um, <clears throat> another, another main aspect of the new law, which was previously not included in the Transsexual Act is that it envisages essentially, essentially criminalizing the act of misgendering and dead naming with possible fines of up to 10,000 euros. <laughs> and here, um, as we realized since reading into it, there are two pretty absurd exceptions to the rule. One of them being that the rule does not apply to the person's spouse they can technically dead name or misgender the person without punishment. And another absurd exception to the rule is that if you say it as part of a compliment, it's not punishable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's obviously been a lot of criticism on both sides, on the, on the feminist side, of course, the, the, the points are the same as you will hear against self-ID laws anywhere. Um, endangers women and children, opens up women's spaces to men, makes an absolute mockery of equal opportunities and women's sports. And here too, women's concerns are shut down as being unfounded and hysterical. Say so People say these things don't really happen, men won't really try and gain access to women's spaces, 
when in fact it is actually already happening in Germany, even without the self-ID law. In Hamburg and Berlin, for example, several male prisoners have already had their requests to be moved to female prisons accepted. And you hear stories all the time about men and women's changing rooms, for example. Yeah, <laughs> you'd, you'd think that the, uh, that the other side would be happy now that the self-ID law that they've been campaigning for for so long has finally yeah, seen, seen some movement now that the draft law has been published, but um, they're not as happy as it seems. They say that it isn't actually that great or better than the Transsexual Act for the transgender community. They say that it isn't validating enough and it's been branded as self-ID light, so to speak. And one of the main reasons that they have branded it as self-ID light is that there are several clauses, I think, which maybe were aimed at um, making it more relaxed for, for business owners. Uh, one of them being that people who operate businesses that are primarily that are for women can refuse entry to men, but they don't have to. And we think this really leaves it wide open. It makes it an individual decision of the, of the little man, the little woman, the sauna operators, managers of women's shelters, gyms and so on, it doesn't actually offer that much legal security. Um, it makes women's freedom and protection an option rather than rather than law. Um, for example, if yeah, even if you've even if you've changed sex, changed your legal sex, you could technically be refused if you're a man, for example, from registering for a, a women's gym or having access to a women's sauna. But, well, you might not, but you might also you might not be refused, but you might be refused. It depends on it depends on the business owner, um, which has consequences that could go either way. Either you refuse a man access and women feel safe and more women sign, sign up to your gym or it goes the other way. You um, uh, get branded as transphobic and lose business. Yeah, that's certainly an area that's not very, um, not very clear and something which really needed, needs to be uh, set in law and not left to individual business owners who may have to judge people based on what they look like. Yeah, so, so far, this law has only been drafted um, and still has to go quite a long way until it may potentially be enshrined or not. It still has to be voted on by various government departments and is currently, is currently being put out to the public, which means that organisations, um, associations and even individuals do you have the chance to put a statement in about what they believe would be the impact of self-ID law? I believe you can still do this till the end of this month. Um, after that, <laughs> the draft law goes back to the cabinet for the next round of decision making. And maybe after the summer break, it will be presented to parliament for the first time to be read. After that's happened, it still has to be revised again by the cabinet and then presented to the relevant committees, the family and legal committees, and also experts will be called and heard. That's still not the end. It still has to go through another one or two rounds in parliament where it will then be voted on. Um, after that, it still has to be voted on by the federal council. I guess you could kind of compare it to something similar to the House of Lords, it has to be voted on by both bodies. And um, that could sway things potentially. If it does get voted in, then it would likely come into force at the beginning of next year. Yeah, as you can imagine, it's, it's a very worrying situation and um, momentum has been growing a lot among feminist groups and women's organisations in Germany. There have been multiple demos and protests this year last year, a lot of people raising awareness on social media, um, putting pressure on the German government. Even, even last year, actually, there was a demo organized by Radfem Berlin right in front of the German government where Sheila Jeffries actually attended and held a speech in the rain. Yeah, uh, there's several other women's initiatives too. Um, 
doing all they can at the moment to raise awareness of the negative impact of self-ID on, on women's rights and trying to put pressure on those in power.